I just wanted to, to share uh, a few thoughts and a few uh, stories that have just been really meaningful to me, and I think we might be able to do some questions or other things, but we'll get into it. But um, as mentioned, I'm the, the new uh, congressman from the New Jersey 3rd Congressional District. Uh, I'm about eight months into the job, so um, still, you know, long enough, not long enough that you can blame me for all of the problems that are happening in Congress. Um, but look, for me, um, this has been a, a real honor of a lifetime, and, uh, and really is something that goes at the heart of what I want to be able to convey. So for me, the reason why I love this job so much is being able to work in and work for my home district. My district in South Jersey gave me and my family everything. Some of you might have heard me talk about some of this before, but you know, my mother and my father, I'm the son of immigrants, and my mother and my father uh, grew up in South Korea. Uh, my dad grew up in an orphanage as a survivor of polio. My mom grew up in a poor farm family to a single mom in an area that was devastated by the Korean War. And uh, so in that way, our lives, just uh, our family was just inextricably linked to national security for the United States and the engagements of our military and our diplomats. And in fact, my dad and my mom worked hard and seized every opportunity they could have, and the opportunities of the United States opened the doors up to them. And my dad, who grew up in an orphanage as a polio survivor, ended up getting a PhD in genetics here in America. And my mom ended up getting a nursing degree to be able to serve the hospital systems in New Jersey. These were opportunities that were brought about because of the policies that happened in the United States here in this town during the Korean War and afterwards in terms of setting forward the strategic partnership and anchor with our United States relationship with South Korea. I am here because of the product of people before me who have set the path and understood what United States global leadership means, who understands the importance of coalitions and the importance of the strategic alliances Understanding that conflicts and the issues that are happening on the other side of the world are critically important to us. So in that vein, I came to be in the, in the United States and, and grew up in South Jersey. And this district that gave me the public school education to become a Rhodes Scholar, to be able to work in national security and diplomacy is now the district that I get to represent in Congress. And it is a very, very humbling experience in that vein. My parents taught me a line based off of all of that they've been through, that has continued to push every fiber of my body in terms of the work that I do. They taught me this line that service isn't just a job, it's a way of life. They taught me that it's not just something you do nine to five and then you check out, it's something about your fundamental relationship to the people around you. Whether they are friends or family or strangers alike, whether they are here amongst us, or in our community, in our state, in our country, or internationally, that we have connections that we have to be able to proceed down. Those are important lessons that have been a critical part of shaping my belief in public service, my belief and my commitment to serving this country. And it doesn't have to be service, it's not just talking about people in government, it's talking about all these other ways in which we can get engaged. My very first job in politics, in service, was working at the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless and understand what it is that we can do, just right in the name of that organization about building coalitions, because that's really what allows us to be able to get the kind of work done that we need. And that's why I'm just so uh, impressed with uh, the work of the, this fellowship and all of you here, especially those of you that are fellows, is because this is how we build that next generation of leadership that is so vitally important and something that I think we need to make sure we continuously invest in and not take anything for granted. A life in public service is, is tough. And as I said, it's about just champions both inside and outside of government working together for common cause, each of us finding our way to be able to do this. But what I have found so incredible about my time coming into DC when I literally showed up for the very first day when I was working at USAID, not knowing a single person in this entire city, to then realizing that I'm not alone because so many people in this city are like me, coming here to be able to make a difference, putting a lot of our lives uh, on, the, on the line, a lot of uh, our uh, experiences on the line, and willing to take chances and take risks to be able to get something done. 
And I've been so uh, impressed and humbled by all the different people that I've met, including a lot of the, uh, the young fellows here in this room today that I've had a chance to be able to just connect in. And I hope we can continue to get to know each other moving forward uh, on what it is that we're trying to do. I wanted to just convey one story that continuously uh, drives me and why it is that it, I took this job, why it is uh, that I am committed to working going forward. Uh, my previous uh, job prior to uh, getting engaged in politics was working at the White House National Security Council. I was the Iraq director there, uh, also helping with the counter-ISIS uh, coordination uh, during the, the height of that war. I remember in the very beginning, if you might remember, uh, there was an incident just about, what it is, I guess about five years ago, um, where one day I walked into the White House and I was briefed and briefed that tens of thousands of people known as the Yazidi people were trapped on top of a mountain called Sinjar Mountain. And I remember going and immediately briefing uh, uh, Ambassador Susan Rice and Dennis McDonough, the Chief of Staff, because what we were told is that, that within a matter of hours or just a few days, we would potentially see the genocide of the Yazidi people. Tens of thousands of people whose lives were at risk at that moment. I remember going in and briefing, I remember talking to Dennis McDonough and him saying, you got to get back to me by 6 p.m. with a plan that we can bring into the Oval Office. And I was able to work with people across the interagency, locking ourselves in the Situation Room, coming up with a plan to be able to get that work done, trying to come up with options that we can bring for this most extraordinary of challenges that I had ever experienced in my life. And sure enough, by 6 p.m., we had a plan to be able to walk into the Oval Office. We did. We briefed the President of the United States, and within about an hour, we had the green light to be able to go ahead. And within 24 hours at that moment, we had U.S. military cargo planes dropping tens of thousands of pounds of food and water and humanitarian assistance on top of a mountain on the other side of the world, deep in enemy territory on top of a mountaintop. It was absolutely extraordinary to see what it is that we were able to accomplish, what this country can do. We can literally move mountains if we wanted to. We can see the extraordinary responsibility that comes with the engagement that we have and with the opportunities that we have. But most importantly, what I learned is just the incredible work of individuals. That it feels sometimes that our government is so big, our bureaucracy is so large, that we wonder whether or not we can actually have an impact these days. What is the role that an individual can have? But those days, I saw how individual people in the Situation Room were able to put together an extraordinary plan and shape the course of that war, put together a plan that could literally save tens of thousands of lives and be the fastest response to genocide in the history of mankind. I was proud to be a part of that. It was my proudest moment and, and, and certainly a very difficult situation and certainly more that I wish we could have gotten done. But that continues to inspire me because on that day in that experience, I saw a government that can inspire. I saw a government that can show us the best of what our country has to offer. And when I look back on it in terms of the conversations in that room and I think about it, no one there in the Situation Room was thinking about, it. is this a Democrat idea or a Republican idea or what's this going to do for an election or the politics of it all. It was about the service. It was about extraordinary minds coming together in extraordinary times. But all of the people in the room were very much ordinary people with public servants that were trying to step on up. That is the kind of experience that I had in my life that sh showed me that when we face these challenges that we have to step up. And we understand that in times of great change and great conflict in our society, you know, we take a quote out from uh, Coretta Scott King that says, we don't throw up our hands, we roll up our sleeves and get to work to try to fix these things going forward. We don't have good government unless we have good people working in government and good people working with government trying to shape the way that we go. So when I saw an opportunity to serve my home district, to be able to try to change the trajectory of things that I saw were very damaging and dangerous to our society, I took it. I'm not a politician. I'm not someone who ever dreamed of running for Congress, but I'm somebody that's deeply committed to public service and deeply willing to take the risks and the challenges that I can be able to have an impact. And when I looked at it and seeing my district, seeing the opportunity that I could have to be able to shape the direction of our country, I thought that there's no way I could 
have anything else or do anything else that would have a greater impact than being able to run for Congress and potentially winning. It was a hard fought fight. My opponent had won the 2016 election, the previous election, by 20 points. Uh, it is, uh, he had spent millions of dollars of his own money, and the people told me there's no way that you'd be able to win this. They told me there's no way that, they, they're like, you, look, you seem like a good kid and all, but there's no way, <laughs> there's no way that, uh, you know, at the time, 34-year-old Korean-American was going to be able to win a district uh, that was 85% white, that voted for Trump by six points, that had less than 1% Korean-American population in the entire district, less than 3% Asian-American in the district. But I stayed focused in on what it is that I thought I could accomplish. I believed in this community. We were able to mobilize 3,000 people in my district to knock doors in the final three days. And this district in Jersey that's 85% white and voted for Trump by six points just elected the very first Korean American Democrat in the history of our country. I share that with you because it, we have to take risks. We have to find ways in which we understand the maximum impact that we can have on our country, where we can be of influence. But mostly, we have to work together to be able to do that. The coalition lessons that we learn are not just ones about multilateralism around the world. It's also about, within our own lives, understanding that we have to build and rebuild and throw, grow, grow forward a new culture of public service in our country. And we see that right here with the fellows, and I'm humbled to be able to be here alongside all of you. We have to find and continue to be inspired by our institutions and government. We have to make sure that we understand what it is that we're trying to accomplish. There's not a day that goes by where I don't recognize that the job I work right now is a has a job description written in the Constitution of the United States. And that is something I think about that's not to boost my ego, but instead to humble me about the challenges that we face. That is the way I think that we need to be moving forward, that we recognize the status quo doesn't have to be the way that we go forward, that a lot of these challenges are going to be there always, but ones that are going to be, require a constant battle. Many of you have fought alongside me on these battles through my career so far, and with the fellows here, I'm looking forward to working alongside you for many of these battles going forward. But you've taken these initial steps of, of moving forward, taking chances and putting yourself out there, and for the others in this room, you have been extraordinary supporters, extraordinary mentors to me and to others. And this is how we're going to work together to build that next generation of leadership going forward. So I'm just grateful to have the chance to be able to spend the evening with all of you and look forward to working alongside all of you to build that new generation of leadership and to rebuild that service mentality and culture in our society that we so badly need. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah.